This is the Ancient and Medieval History Lecture for Tuesday, the 26th of October, 2021. All people should have notepads out and uh, should have their electronics away. Just as I said, three times. Anyway, maybe I'm grumpy. I should probably watch that. A culture is a group of people bound together by certain core beliefs. These beliefs are not casual. They are not things we can easily agree to disagree about. They are things that are so visceral, so basic to what we think is right and wrong, good or evil, that they are worth living for, dying for, or killing for. Notions of cannibalism or incest being evil is almost, not entirely, but almost universally uh, taboo in cultures around the world. Our culture coheres around the notion of personal liberty and freedom. And so we attract people from around the world who come from countries that have very different ways of life. Our public schools are established to acculturate the children of immigrants to become American in thought, word, and deed. To understand the Constitution, understand the English history behind that Constitution, and the Greek, Roman, Christian, and German origins of England, as well as to understand how freedom is practiced in terms of limited government. Government is not the answer to every problem. And a government that can give you everything you want can take everything that you have. We do not have a U.S. government that is in charge of our lives. We do not belong to it. Our government is divided. Federal government has limited responsibilities enumerated in the Constitution's articles and amendments. State governments interact much more closely with us and involve law enforcement. Municipal, county, local governments uh, work with state governments to deal with local needs and local issues, particularly schools. And even the federal government and state government are not unified. We have an executive, which is a president or a governor. We have a legislature that is Congress or the state Congress, state representatives, and the state Senate. And we have a, an independent judiciary where judges can interpret the law without political influence. All of this is designed to diffuse government power. All of this is designed to slow down ideas of efficient government because a government that's too efficient becomes more involved in your life and can more effectively control you. Our founders did not want that. And it comes from, and it all comes from this common devotion that we are supposed to have to the individual freedom, not only of ourselves, but of the people around us. Different societies cohere around different ideas. While a culture is a group of people bound together by core beliefs, a civilization has five necessary characteristics. A civilization is a culture, but a culture that has cities, specialized labor, writing, advanced technology, and complex institutions. If you lack one of those things, it's not a civilization. So if you have a society that has interesting legends, interesting folkways, wonderful food, cool clothing, but they don't build cities, they're a culture, not a civilization. This applies to many interesting peoples, the Eskimos or Inuits, the Irish, um, many of the tribes of Sub-Saharan Africa, many of the tribes of the Amazon jungle and of Southeast Asia. Whereas you can have a group of people that has a very bland and boring culture, but if they build cities, and have all the other qualities, specialized labor, writing, advanced technology, and complex institutions. They are, in fact, a civilization. Just like multicellular life can do things that single-celled organisms cannot, civilizations can do things that cultures cannot do. They have superpowers as compared to cultures. And it's because these cultures have developed things that make them much more powerful than they otherwise would be. 
So let's look at these qualities and see what we can discover. The absolute basis of civilization, it's even in the word, see we toss city, civilization, is you need to have a city or cities that are built. Towns are not cities. What defines a city is it is so big that if trade were to break down, if money were to suddenly become worthless, if you and I would not exchange goods and services with people from the outside to bring in food, to bring in power, to bring in fuel, to bring in whatever it is we need, could we survive on our own? If the society or the, the settlement is small enough, theoretically there's enough land for people to spread out over, there are enough people on that land who understand how to work it so that the others could be trained, and you'd have at least a fighting chance, a fighting chance of keeping most of your people alive. But in cities with dense packed populations, people on top of one another in apartments, most of the ground covered in concrete, way too big. Way too many people on too small a parcel of land. Without trade, most people will die. So that rather harsh and depressing definition is at the heart of what is a city. Now, why are cities so bleeping important? Well, cities are engines of progress. They are lenses of creativity. They are the living, beating hearts of their societies. Just like blood is brought through your heart to your lungs, to your digestive system. The heart moves the lung, uh, the blood, so that the blood can carry life-giving oxygen and nutrients to the cells all over your body. Cities do the same thing. Trade happens in the cities. There's some light trading in the countryside, but for the most part, when people want to sell their goods, farmers selling their produce, for example, people go to the city because that's where the customers are. That's where the hungry mouths are that will eat your mangoes or your bananas or your grain. By bringing all these people together, cities can also be lenses of progress. Concentrating creative people, in enough tension to make their creativity pop. Popcorn is useless unless you heat it. Without heat, popcorn are just a bunch of nasty metal-like grains. But if you heat it, the popcorn explodes and becomes tasty, if you like that sort of thing, especially with good butter and salt. The pressure of cities to survive, to compete, to perform, all causes the creativity, like that popcorn, to erupt out of its kernel and pop. Cities are therefore engines of progress, as well as lenses of creativity, as well as the, bless you, the living beating hearts of their community. Here's why else cities are important. You get 10,000 people together in a small area, which by ancient standards could qualify as a city. More people means more of the same problem. Try to provide them with enough clean water to drink every single day. It's not easy. Try to provide them with a way of getting rid of their waste that doesn't pollute or poison everything. Try to get a way for them to be able to meet all of their needs by buying and selling things. So you've got to have, to have a functional city, water system of some kind, a sewer system of some kind, a system of trade of some kind that allows people to exchange their skills and services and goods for other skills and services and goods that they, they need to survive. Without a medium of trade, whether it's barter or money, you can't survive in a city. You need to exchange. There's also manners. People are irritating. How do you deal with irritating people? 
You're walking through the street and somebody knocks you over, pa bam, and they're in too much of a hurry or they're too much of a jerk to slow down and at least apologize or offer you a hand up or whatever. What do you do? In a state of nature, you might pull out a weapon and end them if you're angry enough, not because that's a reasonable response, but because you're angry. How do you control people when they're angry? Well, you get them to control themselves. So you come up with manners and you come up with customs and you come up with ways of dealing with each other that don't always involve the pulling of deadly weapons and the execution of those annoying, annoying people. To have a city work, you as a culture must find ways of solving countless problems. If you don't, your cities will fail. But if you do, your society will be the stronger for it. If you have all of these things, this panoply of things that makes a city function, you have abilities that your tribal neighbors simply do not because they haven't had to deal with solving these problems themselves because they don't concentrate people in such proximity to one another that it becomes a problem. So that's cities. Now we look at specialized labor. The nomadic hunter-gatherer is a generalist. If I'm a man in a hunter-gatherer community, I find my raw materials. I then make my tools and weapons myself. Ting, 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 flat. Or I grind bone, or I sharpen my stick and harden it in the fire, or I strap a bone knife to the tip of my stick and I end up with a spear. I come up with a club, I make the club better by putting a rock on it. Maybe I use an atlatl, which means I have to make an atlatl, the little cuppy thing that throws the spear dart and the dart itself. To make a dart like that is not what you're going to find in nature. You've got to grind wood into almost a dowel shape with a point on it. All of these things are done by the men. In addition to repairing their own clothing, in addition to hunting, scouting warfare, in addition to doing what they can to make the meat they bring in edible, which could include cutting the right parts off, cutting the wrong parts and throwing them away, cleaning the, cleaning the kill is what a hunter would call it today getting rid of the intestines so that the intestines don't poison the rest of the body. All of these things and more are done by every man. Now they might help one another, but basically they, they are responsible for their own gear, their own stuff. Women, they may work together to strip a field of anything valuable while they gather. They may work together while they help make clothing and repair clothing and help with tool making and all the rest, but they have to do everything. A woman has to be able to cook, to clean, to gather. A woman has to be able to also help make tools and use them to make things, including clothing. A woman has to be able to make the food that she and other women gather palatable for eating. That's, that's good. And healing. So all of these things, are done by everyone. You are a jack of all trades, but a master of none. Now, specialized labor. See, generalist is another way of saying jack of all trades. Today, there are people who work in factories. A few in the United States, more outside of the United States. There used to be a lot of people in the U.S. worked in a factory. What's the advantage of being a meat puppet in an assembly line? Is there an advantage? Well, let me explain. I'm going to use a modern automobile example, just because. But this applies to any form of production or any form of specialization. So, my job is to take a power uh, 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 
uh, driver, like a screwdriver. And <laughs> attach an engine that comes in on a swing, swinging little crane, lower it into the uh, body of the chassis, the body of the vehicle, and attach the engine block to the chassis, and then the vehicle's thing moves in, and another uh, engine shows up, and I bring it down, and I... <laughs> and I attach the engine to the chassis, and everything moves on, and that's all I do all day, every day, while I'm at work. Sounds dull. Might be. But here's the advantage. I do this job better than anyone else, except other people in other factories that have the same bloody job I have. Nobody knows the movements, what it takes to take this heavy engine to use the particular qualities of the crane to move the engine effectively into the right spot and attach it with the, uh, with the driver, with the, 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 the screwdriver the bolt attacher, whatever you want to call it. Nobody knows this job better than I do. Now, when I'm first hired, I stink at it. I'm a trainee. They're not going to rely on me for production. They're going to have me help out and in a training area, learn how I'm going to pull the engine forward on the crane and how I'm going to move it down without crushing myself or the car or destroying the engine, how I'm going to operate this drill without shooting it through somebody's foot or skull. <clears throat> And how I'm going to do all of this speedily enough and properly enough to reliably put the engine in the chassis in a firm and uh, long-lasting fashion. After a month or two, I'm probably good enough to go on the production line. But I'm still not very good. I'm going to finish this and then I'll take your question. However... After a few months, I'm going to be really good at this particular job. And there's a suggestion box in the cafeteria. And I decide I've got to do wing down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight attachment points with small to medium sized bolts. What if instead I used bigger bolts? and the central that's five bolts rather than eight they're larger bolts and it should actually secure the engine in the car better who would have come up with that the engineers no me because i'm doing the job i have an insight into the work no one else has yes oh i was just gonna say that i saw this quote once that said you get you get paid on how hard, uh, hard you are to replace, not on how hard you work. That's true. It makes more sense. That, I've never heard that before. If you want, write it down and email it to me, and I may find a way, a place on the wall for it. I don't remember who said it. I just remember that. Well, I can look it up. And it may just be an axiom. It may be one of those things that's just that's just out there. You get paid by how much, how difficult you are to replace, not how much, how hard you work. That's good. Thank you. We don't do things the way we did 50 or 100 or 200 years ago. Our technology has steadily improved. Why? Because we have specialists. And these specialists are focused on their jobs like nothing else. And they can come up with ideas. So uh, I, write, I write my idea out in the suggestion box, drop it in, and an engineer picks it up, gets, 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 uh, gets the uh, drawing I made, and then, from his standpoint, has to look it over and see if it would work. It is possible that I might come up with a way of improving production. It is impossible that I might find a way of saving enough money on each car to give real more, you know, to allow us to lower our prices or to invest in something else to make our cars more competitive. I might actually help us to stay in business, which, if you're working, is a good thing. Because if your company doesn't stay in business, you're out of a lock. You're out of a job. So specialized workers are where most progress comes from, even when they're not at work. A lot of guys who work in factories tinker. 
they have a workstation in the garage and they they try to you know build engines or they try to repair things or they're they're working on finding something that might just make them a lot of money and make the world a better place too like the person who came up with the little plastic thingies on the end of your shoelaces just try to imagine how difficult it is to put shoelaces through the little eye holes they have without those little plastic thingies. It's not pretty. I know I've done it because the plastic thingies came off because we couldn't afford new clothes when I was a kid. So I had hand-me-downs and uh, they, they included shoes that had ragged laces and plastic thingies came off. So I used tape when I could get it. Little things tend to make the world a much better place. So specialized labor, as compared to generalists who do everything, specialists do just one thing. They do just one thing, just one thing well enough to get paid. I have managed to persuade a bunch of adults <laughs> that I'm good enough at this job to be worth money. And someday you will do the same thing. You will find something hopefully that you like doing, that you're good at, and you will persuade people that it's worth paying you to do this thing that you're good at. And with that money, you'll be able to have a family, you'll be able to have travel, you'll be able to do things that will make your life worth living. All by earning that. So, cities specialize labor. Writing. What is the advantage of writing? Hmm. 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 I mean, how, how much emphasis has been placed on writing in your education? How many years have they spent, they being teachers like me, who tell you that you should have good penmanship and that you should understand grammar and that you should have a good vocabulary and that you should be able to write well and speak well so that you don't look like a doofus when you're trying to do something out in the world? Because if you don't talk good, you may be good at doing stuff, but if you don't talk good, people are not necessarily going to take you seriously. Your ability to express yourself, your ability to be effective at persuading people, your ability to hold your own against people who understand that your life could be done better if you just listen to them. All of these people that want things from you or of you, or want you to be, if they're more eloquent than you, you could be bludgeoned and beaten, not with fists, but with words. There could be something really important that you have to say. Because you understand something that nobody else seems to get. It will happen. And when it does, what are you going to do? If you can't speak or write persuasively, that insight probably will fail to be adopted. And people may suffer because they weren't willing to listen to you. Not just because they're dumb, but because you were inarticulate. The words we use are the connections that we make with one another. Otherwise, we're just trapped in this shell of meat and bone that is our skull. Language is very important. But writing is different from speaking. So, I'm going to read something that was probably written for the first time about uh, 1,100 years ago and probably codified for the first time 13 or 1,400 years ago. It's going to be in English, Old English, which is a lot like Dutch. But English. Davis on Morgan, mine gefraag, im pagi held, gut rink mening, fair dun folk tögen, fair on und nie, geund vik vegas, funsors ke ven, lapis lastas. No his lief getal, sarlik punte, seca. E hirnum, para pie tir lesas, trodes que volda, hu he venge molda, on venge panson, nita o circumen 
on nirka mer felge un gefilde me fer lasters bear der wes on blöde brim velende atol ida gesving ihr germende haton hefelde hero drero veol der fege deug Sidan Rema les in fin Fredo fer elge hepen selve peron him hel in feng. I know, I just went on and on. But this is what that means. Then morning came, and many a warrior gathered, as I've heard, among the gift hall, clan chiefs, flocking from far and near, down <coughs> wide ranging roads, wondering greatly at their at the monster's footprints. His fatal departure was regretted by no one who had witnessed his trail, the ignominious marks of his flight, where he'd skulked away, exhausted in spirit and beaten in battle, bloodying the path, hauling his doom to the demon's mere the bloodshot water wallowed and surged. There were loathsome upthrows and overturnings of waves and gore and wound slurry. With his death upon him, he had dived deep into the marsh, his marsh den, drowned out his life, and his heathen soul, hell claimed him there. This is from the Anglo-Saxon, actually the Danish saga, Beowulf. Beowulf is probably between 13 and 1400 years old for sure, maybe older. It is the part of the story of Beowulf where the monster Grendel, who has been raiding King Hrothgar's oils, had his arm ripped out at the stump or at the, at the socket by Beowulf. And he was retreating from Hero, the, the, the mead hall of, of King Hrothgar, to his mother's swampy lake where he would dive and die, thus provoking his mother to get involved in the story. Why does this matter? Because the people who wrote this, even their bones are turning to ash. 1400 years, first written down by Christianized Anglo-Saxons about 1100 years ago. The people who came up with those words are long gone. There is a vast gulf of space and time between us and the people who came up with them. But I can read their words with precision. And if I understand Old English, which I don't, but other people do, if I, can under if I understand Old English, I can read the thoughts of the writer as he wrote them down so long ago so many lifetimes ago. That's amazing. That's magical. Let's go beyond that, though. Let's say we want to build a pyramid or a temple, a ziggurat, or some kind of monument or palace. Hey, you workers, go to the quarry and carve some stone into blocks. And bring it here. And we'll stack the blocks, like a little kid, and make a palace or a temple or a ziggurat or a pyramid. What could go wrong with directions like those? <laughs> what could possibly happen that might not be expected or desired? You know what little kids do when they make stuff? Occasionally, just a bit, they kind of collapse because they're little kids and they're figuring out how things work. This is why Legos are easier to work with than blocks, because blocks slide off one another. You can click Legos into place with one another and they'll actually hold their shape better. But even a Lego object will fall apart given the proper stresses. You build something out of stone and create an open space inside, which, which even pyramids have, Ah, you're inviting everyone inside to get pancaked. 
by the ceiling. So you'd better darn well know what you're doing. Writing allows an architect to draw plans, to write out specific instructions, like which workers are going to get what kind of stone from where in the quarry. Precisely how big will the blocks and what shape will the blocks and what type of stone will the blocks be made of? How will they be shipped so as not to shatter the blocks or kill all the workers? How are you going to pay the workers? In beer. Believe it or not, liquid bread. And it makes you feel happy. And whips. <laughs> lots and lots of whips. So a combination of whips and beer. That's like the, uh, the stick and the carrot. And it worked. But you can't build a complex thing like a pyramid, a ziggurat, a temple, or a palace without writing. Verbal directions don't cut it. Because the chief engineer cannot be anywhere, everywhere they, that he needs to be. That's why you write things down. There's a scene from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade where Indy is chiding his dad, played by Sean Connery, Why don't you remember that, Dad? They're riding in a motorcycle. And Sean Connery says, because, of course, they speak the same, being father and son, Indiana, I wrote it down so I wouldn't have to remember it. Because Sean Connery is Scottish, and he doesn't hide his accent. He has that accent. I'll say that again. I wrote it down so I wouldn't have to remember it. We write things down to help us remember or so we don't have to remember. My wife, who's a very good cook, my wife still takes out a recipe from time to time. Even for things that she's been making the same way for decades. Because she wants to make sure she doesn't forget something. So writing things down allows us to engage in complex planning. But that's not all. We can also use it to educate you. Yep, we can use it to help teach you things. Like the classic literature of our race or of our culture. What it really does is allows for precise communication over vast gulfs of space and time. Let's say for a moment that <laughs> I'm the President of the United States, and the Chinese chairman is making trouble over in Asia. Now, I want to convey to Chairman Xi that I am not going to let him invade Taiwan, and if he tries, I'm going to use American military force to stop him. But I don't want a war if I can help it. So I want to convey a, a, a precise message in a nuanced fashion that will allow Xi to save face, because that's important in that part of the world, that will allow Xi to get something for being good and not invading his neighboring country of Taiwan. I'm going to write my message down, and I'm going to have it read by my own people in the State Department and the Pentagon, which is the diplomats and the military. And I'm going to run it by some people I trust. And only when they help me work out the wrinkles am I going to send this precise message halfway around the world to the leaders of the People's Republic of China. And even then, my ambassador, who speaks not only English, but Chinese, Mandarin Chinese, is going to then have to translate this nuanced message into Chinese. Now, maybe our people did that, but he's going to have to make sure. And then, to convey the exact meaning I wanted to convey, rather than to provoke a needless war or, or to just let him know that I'm just saying this, but he can go ahead and invade because we're not going to really do anything. I want to make sure that those mistakes don't happen. I want to make sure he understands precisely what my meaning is. So I write it down. And I also take an interest in the translation of it. 
because I want to make sure that the precise message is conveyed over time and space. So writing allows for complex plans, and it allows for precise communication, like those words over a vast gulf of time, or my message to the president, uh, the chairman of China, uh, over a vast gulf of space. Oddly enough, in the interstellar spacecraft Voyagers 1 and 2, which we've sent out, we, we launched them in, I think, 77. These two probes, which gave us the first picture of Jupiter's rings, and they were very important uh, for understanding the planets, they're now in interstellar space, and each of them carries a gold plaque. And on that plaque is a location map of the sun compared to a bunch of local pulsar stars, assuming that that may be the way somebody navigates. And there's a line drawing of a man and a woman, naked because they want to demonstrate our species. And there's a, there's a record, a record with a needle black vinyl record. I think it actually also may be made of gold because it's, it's preserved. And if somebody activates the record, it has greetings from the people of the world in like 24 different languages. It starts out with greetings in English from who, the guy Kurt, Kurt Waldheim, who was the Secretary General of the United Nations. So even if at some point, some alien species or our distant future selves finds one of these probes. We've written things down with symbols that are designed to help <coughs> whoever finds it understand. Even there, we're trying to write things down. So, City Specialized Labor Writing. Advanced Technology! <laughs> Advanced technology reshapes and redefines lifestyle. If you've got baths and sewers and fresh water, you can be clean. If you don't, the best you're probably going to be able to do is bring water into the city and then let people take sponge baths. They're not going to be as clean. And let people do what they did after Rome and before Rome, which is use chamber pots for their waste. And when the chamber pot was full or the maid or the housewife was ready, she'd take this sloshing, hopefully capped thing and bring it over to the second floor window if you have one, open up the, the shutters, and she might, if she's feeling nice that day, go, look out below, slosh. If not, she'll just take it out the front door and slosh, or she'll just let it fly. And this is why men walk outbound of women. You're on a sidewalk. You're on a date. There's a guy. There's a gal. There's the wall. The gentleman is always on the roadside of the lady, regardless of which side of the street. Here's why. First off, if there's a threat, it's probably not going to come out of the wall. Probably, we hope, it will come from the street. And remember, gentlemen, our job is to protect. So if somebody's going to be put between the lady and harm, it's going to be us. So we're already between them, number one. Number two, look out below, slosh. It's not going to go straight down, but if it's going to hit anyone, it's not going to hit the lady. It's going to hit us, guys. You wonder why men wear hats? Well, that's one reason. It's not the only reason, it's not even the most important reason. But trust me, when uh, an entire slosh droplet of dreck, that is German for solid human waste, is flying towards your head, it's nice to have a hat with a big wide brim. brim. <laughs> brim. That was the sewage treatment plan for medieval cities. Throw the waste in the street and let the rain wash it away. But what if it doesn't rain for two or three months through the summer? No, then then you end up with an extra padding of animal waste because you know you have <laughs> mules and horses and cows and sheep and pigs and goats and everything else walking through your streets, plus the slosh slish slosh of human waste that just gets tossed there, tossed there. So if it doesn't rain from the end of June to the beginning of September, 
It just bakes on. Layer after noisome layer. And then it would rain, and hopefully it takes most of it away. Hopefully. But a layer down into the ground. I don't know. It, it, was, it was not pretty. So you develop the technology of sewers, and it makes such a difference. What about this technology? Walls. Now, you might not think a wall is very important, but if you live in a world filled with roving armed barbarians, a wall can be kind of helpful. Because inside the city, you've got all your wealth, and you've got your, your family, you've got your, your women, your children, and um, between you and the hairy, scary barbarians who just love drinking and killing for fun, there's this wall, and you can climb up on it and throw things down on them, like rocks or boiling oil. You can shoot at them with bows and, and throw spears down on them. And you you got the high ground. You do. So the wall is actually a very important invention. Now, hopefully your wall isn't really tall and really thin, so all the enemy has to do is walk up and go, Beesh! That's the word you, the sound you make when you knock a, a thin wall over it. Beesh! Uh, no, hopefully your wall is nice and strong and thick and heavy enough to handle some punishment. Even then, you're going to have problems because they'll try to cover, climb over the wall with ladders or, uh, or dig under the wall with, with miners. And if they have gunpowder, which eventually they will, they'll, they'll put an explosive under your wall and just blow it up. Or this is what they did before explosives. They would dig a bunch of holes under a wall and have a bunch of wood struts holding up the ceiling. And then they'd spread tar throughout the tunnels, which is flammable, and they'd light it all on fire. And when the wood burned, it would cause a collapse, and the earth under the wall would collapse, and the wall would collapse. That's genius. It is. And it worked. It took a long time. And, of course, the people inside the city didn't want them to happen. So sometimes the people inside the city would dig their own holes, and you'd have under subterranean combat between guys in lightless tunnels fighting over what to do. I mean, war, war is scary. <laughs> and and it, it, it has many different facets to it. So high technology is one of the things that allows people to live in these cities without um, dying of poison, disease, or being killed by every group of tough guys that comes along and has a bunch of weapons. Of course, if you live inside a city wall, you're going to be crowded. You're going to be right up against your neighbors in one way or another. You're going to have to live close. And there's also this. Even if you don't take into account the animal and human waste that I was just talking about, in cities you do things like make leather and glue and dye to change the color of your clothing. And all of these things stink. I mean, worse than a slaughterhouse. And you've got those too. So you've got the slaughterhouse where you bring your, 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 your animals to get slaughtered and turned into nice meat. And that's gonna smell because you've got animals without refrigeration getting sliced up into bits and their blood all over the place and it's just, it's bad. But what's worse is the kind of smell you get when you're making dye because you're using primitive chemistry and or when you're making leather or when you're making glue. Those things smell awful. I mean, horribly bad. So city air is foul, stench filled, practically solid with all the various gunk of thousands of lives lived close together. Unwashed bodies in the summertime, uh, uh, glue, uh, dye, leather making, slaughterhouse, animals in the streets, um, people throwing their chamber pots out the door and window. But as stinky as city air is, it, there's an old saying. I don't know where it comes from. It's an axiom. City air is free air. And what that means is, is that if you can't find a job in the countryside, or if you don't like your life in the countryside, you can go to the city. And it's the only place you won't be judged by who your father is. In the city, you're judged by what you are able to produce, by what you're able to do on the job. So if you can't fit in anywhere else in society, if you go to a city, you have a fighting chance of getting a job and living a decent life. City air 
is freer. So advanced technology not only reshapes and redefines lifestyle, it also multiplies the power and abilities of your society. Here's high technology, the chariot. The early horses were not big enough for an armed man to ride anywhere. Okay, they were just too small and weak. So what early warriors used to do is, is, is they'd get into a cart. The Egyptians used two-wheeled carts. The Hittites and others used four-wheeled carts. And in this cart, there'd be a driver, and there'd be a guy who fights. There are usually a bunch of javelins, which are throwing spears, and, or maybe a bow, or, or, or something like that. And so you're riding a cart into battle. Yeah, and you've got two or four horses. And you're going through the battlefield with a wheeled cart, killing anyone that's an enemy soldier nearby. Now, that gives you advantages that most foot soldiers lack, that you can be faster than a foot soldier. You can run your horses through an enemy shield wall. If they're not serious, you'll crush them. And you'll be able to kill people and get away before they can counter-strike. That's a good technology. Now, which is better, the two-wheeled or the four-wheeled cart? There are different opinions on that. Of course, when people develop the technology, if you want to call it that, if through animal husbandry of breeding a horse large enough to ride into battle, the chariot looks slow and clunky compared to a person on horseback. It doesn't maneuver well compared to a person on horseback. So eventually, the technology of breeding better horses turns the technology of chariots obsolete. Nobody needs chariots anymore because we've got horse cavalry. We've got horse soldiers. I think, so it multiplies the powers and abilities of your society. I think that's where I'm going to leave it. We'll talk about complex institutions tomorrow. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? I will point out to the people at home that this is a class that happens first thing in the morning, and sometimes people seem a little tired when they walk in. Have a good day.